Yeah. This needs some fixing. I can't sit on this. My ass is falling out. to fix this and let me just start out by serving you a really hot disclaimer I haven't done this before yeah this is not good okay babes let me walk you through the process of fixing this chair just in case you want to do it as well like you don't have to you can also sit back and relax but step number one is to remove the seat and the backrest from the frame of the chair which we will get back to in a little bit now that you have the broken parts in front of you you want to start cutting away all the broken material this is because we're obviously gonna replace it and basically it's all glued down into these grooves that run along the frames of the chair and it's a little bit tricky getting it all out so I would highly highly recommend getting some hot soapy water and then just kind of pour that over the grooves let it sit for a little while and then get some tools and start <laughs> digging I don't know the goal is to just get everything out of the groove and it's a little bit tricky I I just use the regular screwdriver you can use whatever you have that's sharp try not to break the edges I low-key did that <laughs> a couple of places but whatever but this is a time-consuming task and because it's gonna take a while how about I share with you some fun facts about this chair? Okay, so you probably know this chair as the Cheska chair, but its original name was B32. It was designed in 1928 by Hungarian designer and former Bauhaus student Marcel Breuer. Breuer had experimented with chair design ever since he had joined the Bauhaus, and his vision was simple, to marry form and function through common accessible materials. He was actually inspired by the steel frame of his Adler bicycle, which heavily influenced the tubular frame of the chair. The material was lightweight, sturdy, and malleable enough to create the modernist furniture he envisioned. He first explored this medium when designing the Wassily chair and the Lassio table back in 1925. Mass production and standardization had already made me interested in polished metal, in shiny and impeccable lines in space as new components for our interiors. I considered such polished and curved lines not only symbolic of our modern technology, but actually technology itself. You see, during the 1920s, there was a social change with a stronger labor force, and the consumer demand for inexpensive, functional furniture geared the design concept for chairs towards industrial design and functionalism. The aesthetics changed in favor of modernism and clear lines, and along with this came the mass production of furniture. Some designers and architects hoped that the merge between industry and design would in fact improve the taste of the public. And then, as you can imagine, the Cheska chair actually began as a mass-produced item and was considered perhaps one of the most common chairs at the time. Anyway, the Cheska chair was manufactured by Michael Tonnet, but then, in the early 1960s, the modern Italian furniture manufacturer Gavina Group acquired Acquired the rights to the design. You might have noticed that I'm saying Cheska and not Seska, and this is because Dino Gavina, the company's founder and owner, decided to rename the chair from B32 to the Cheska after Breuer's daughter Francesca. Then, in 1968, the Knoll Group acquired the Gavina Group when they went bankrupt and brought the designs of Breuer to the forefront of popular taste. They continue to manufacture the Cheska chair today. Getting the glue out of the groove is kind of the main annoying job. I've been on it for three and a half hours. This one's good. This one's really good. The seat, however, is taking a hot second. So I feel like I'm done. I'm gonna stop now. It's actually getting dark outside. This is taking, this is, this is a day's project. So, if you're in a rush, it's not the project for you. Ugh. But yeah, I'm pretty, pretty happy with the result. It's just a slow, slow, slow process. 
Okay, so I needed a little snack, and if you needed a little snack, now we're all full, and we can get on with step number three, which is to paint the frames. Now, you don't have to do this. You could keep the natural color. Personally, I think they look better when they're black, so I painted them black. Step number four, get your new rattan. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but let's all appreciate my freaking sexy outfit. <laughs> See those socks? They're comfy. Anyway, you wanna cut the rattan with approximately two centimeters extra on each side. This is so that you have some wiggle room for step number five. But before we get there, you want to soak the rattan. I just put them in the sink for a good half an hour. You could, if you have a bucket, I don't know. At this point, the rattan should be malleable. Sorry if I'm butchering that word. Basically, it should be softer. And then you want to get your favorite tool, which is a spatula, more commonly found in a kitchen drawer. Now, I just kind of bend the rattan and then I use the spatula to push it down into the groove of the sheet. And then I'm using these little wooden sticks. There's probably other things you could use, but this is what I'm using. And I'm pushing it down with the rattan to keep it in place. One of the tricky parts is getting, getting it to be even. You want to try and line up the holes in the rattan along the groove of the seat. And this is a little bit difficult. I actually, mine didn't come out all straight, but at the end of the day, who, who freaking cares? When you reach the corners, there's a lot of, it's just like kind of thick. So to make it easier, you could pull out some of the, some of the rattan. I'm getting somewhere. Like, I'm getting somewhere, but I'm at like the final step where I need to glue this into the groove of the chair and I can't get it to fucking stick. New day. I made an absolute mess yesterday. I've made my life so much harder and <laughs> it was looking so good and I just kind of low-key ruined it. The main issue was the fact that I couldn't keep the thing in place for the glue to dry. And as a result, I fucked it up. <laughs> oh. This has become a true test of my patience. It's just something about things. So. It, if I put something on the shelf and it keeps falling out, like I put it there and it falls right back out. Or like this, put it down and it keeps popping out. Just stay down. Just stay the freak down. If it keeps happening over and over and over again, I get so mad. Like it makes me so angry. I'm no, sorry, guys. Please don't move Stay so down. <sighs> oh, but I mean, I'm still feeling positive. I'm feeling positive. So, I've got some reinforcements. These little bad boys saved my ass. And it annoys me that I didn't have them from the start, but as you can tell, what they're doing is helping me keep the little wooden thing in place long enough for the glue to dry. Then I repeated the same process for the backrest. I wish I had more than three of these because it took me quite a long time. I just had to wait for the glue to dry. Okay, final step. I'm using this kind of polishing cream. It's from a brand called Sea Soaps and it's basically made out of white clay and lemon. And I'm just using it to polish the metal. It's all good stuff in there. And as you can tell, it's really shiny and pretty.
this shot you can tell how the rattan like is a little bit crooked but you know what i don't care i'm just proud i did it Thanks for hanging out and I'll catch you next time.